I said the presence of God is a phrase that that is used all the time. We all hear of it. But have you ever really considered what it really means? How the presence of God actually plays out in our lives on a daily basis? And how, how do we actually even enter into the reality of pursuing him? And I think we all know that you will never, I will never pursue him on my own. That's an impossibility according to the word of God. Pursuit of God can only come by the spirit of the living God touching us and causing us to pursue him. Our part is to respond to that. But only he can ignite the fire in us and light the heart into such a manner we will actually run after his presence. Doesn't mean we don't believe in Jesus. But to run after the presence of God, he has to ignite that fire. But again, like I said, we have a place, part to play, and that's a response that we choose. So tonight as we look at this, just keep your heart open. I pray that even as I've been studying and pulling out some of my old stuff, uh, it's really challenged me. You know, in, in the prisons, we're always talking about transforming revival and you can't talk about transforming revival with talking about the presence of God because only revival period and transforming revival all comes from the presence, from the glory of the Lord. So we're going to just see tonight, I think, in, in how it applies to us, um, where our hearts drift, how we drift, and um, he knows that. But he, it's his goodness. And that's why he shows us himself and reveals himself because he wants us to understand his presence. So, um, just a, a quote by A.W. Tozier says The highest accomplishment of man is to break forth from spiritual bondage and into the presence of God. How many of us know that so often we live in a, in a time in history where spiritual bondage is prevalent we are caught up in religion we're caught up in the way things are done we're caught in, up into a right time of ministry a right time of worship you know a certain song certain this the, all, all these peripheral things that at the end of the day can be him or not be him and we want everything broken in our lives that we that hinder our relationship and our pursuit we all want that gone so the pursuit of god's presence is not a means to the end it is actually the end in itself god is continually trying to bring us back where we actually experience his presence. And he wants to bring us from the understanding positionally that yes, we're in his presence because his presence, he's omnipresent. So his presence is everywhere. He's in all of creation. He's all around us. He's here, no question. But he's trying to bring us back to where we actually experience his presence actually experience his presence this is what we're made for this is what we were created for to walk with him and actually experience the living god and the presence of god and people who want this these are the ones that the bible speaks of you could call them desperate for his presence because the one requirement to enter in and encounter the presence of God, you have to, there's one requirement that must be met. And that requirement is you cannot experience it without moving from convenience and personal comfort. Can't be done. It's the seeking heart. It's the searching heart. That's the ones that love him. They're passionate. That's next week's topics, passion for his presence. Passion propels us 
into this reality that I have to have more. I have to encounter him. I have to touch him. So from Genesis to Revelation, his purpose in redemption was to bring man back to the manifest presence of God. He is longing to bring us all back. And we can long for him, which is awesome, but longing for him is not encountering him. He wants us to long, but he wants us to enter into an encounter. It's both and. One of the problems with experiencing the presence of God is that you could say that backsliding is actually what stops us from aching for his presence. It's the drift. When we drift off of hunger and thirst, we've stopped pursuing the presence. He knows we're going to do that, but he continues to issue the call to awaken us to turn back and re return to the pursuit of him. And we need revelation of this. We need revelation that his presence makes everything different. As we behold him, he transforms us as we're in his presence. We can do the religious thing and never be transformed. But it's in his presence that transformation happens. The transformation in the depth of my being and yours shows us to the depth of our actually touching and encountering the presence of God. Um, but it takes revelation into that. You can look at Moses in Exodus 33, 15. says, if your presence does not go with me, um, take me not from here. You see, Moses encountered the presence of God in such a manner that he was changed into the reality that why would he get up? Why would he get up? For, I got to have you. Either you're, I got to have you or I'm staying here forever. That still applies today. But when I'm talking about comfort and things, we use it, well, I have to get up to go to work, to do this, to do that, this long list of worldly things. He knows that. But he also knows the hours he's given us and the hours that we have to actually pursue him. But it should lead us to the place with the heart that says, I don't want to get up. I cannot leave your presence. I am in, it's not just a quiet time. It's not just a prayer time. I am encountering and dwelling in the presence of God. He's here with me. He's around me. He's in me. And he's wanting to manifest in pre his presence in my life and in your life. Jeremiah 29, 13. We all know this scripture it says, you will seek me. And you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. A scripture that, that's quoted millions of times, millions of times. If you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. So if I'm not finding him, what does that say? It's really saying if you're not finding me, you're not seeking with me or searching with, for me with a whole heart, with all of your heart. There's no in between. And the seeking heart, the searching heart is, think about this, when you're thirsty, what are you going to do? You're going to go get a drink of water, right? When you're hungry, what are you going to do? You're going to get up and go get something to eat. And he's applying that same thing to man. That if you're hungry for me, you're going to get up and search for me and seek after me. You're going to lay every other reality aside until you find me. So what are just a few of the, there's so many more, but just what are a few of the um, barriers to experiencing his presence? And in our day, one of them would be, and probably the, what I believe is the number one is lack of adoration. Now, you might all say, but I worship all the time. I do, you know, 
I'm in the word all the time. I'm doing all the right stuff. But adoration is setting our heart on this glorious God in his nature and his character where we're looking at his awe, his majesty, and his splendor. And in our day, we have actually lost that. And I think all of us could say that as a whole, the church has lost the true awe of God the true understanding of his majesty and his splendor. So we've lowered him down to the size of man. Once we ignore the reality of the presence and what that represents, we begin to lower the standard of who he is. And we begin to, what Tozer says, create him in our image. Once we bring down the reality of who God is, and we relate to him, we begin relating to him as if it's man to man rather than man to God. And that is an area that we need to grasp deeply it's for all of us and in the house of prayer especially that, that our adoration is to be set up on, wow, this God that is full of majesty and splendor and glory that we should stand in absolute awe of who he is, that we should be overwhelmed by his presence and the awe of his presence, that he would choose us. Another one would be just the simplicity of being comfortable. You know, we live in an age of comfortability, that we have everything we need, and we want everything our way. And that, but what we do is we begin to shift it around where his presence becomes secondary. It actually never we don't recognize it i would encourage you i put up today on the encounter challenge mike bickle and bill johnson and um, damien from egypt and uh francis chan and three or four others about a three-hour zoom call that they did today and you just, you, you, it's a, such a great example. They're not talking about what God does. They're overwhelmed by the majesty and awe of him and how he's changed them on the inside and what he's still changing. The discussion's not about healing the sick and doing all the glorious works. It's about the nature and the character of God that they're overwhelmed to the point of weeping over just the conversation they're having as friends and the awe of God in friendships. So then another one is just living attached to the world. It's so easy for us to live attached to the world. And naturally sin, naturally compromise. But he has a, um, the Lord is so good. He has an answer. He has a remedy for all that. So tonight I wanna to start out here, um, Psalm 139, 9, David asked, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. In other words, he's describing the omnipresence of God, that he is everywhere. Everywhere. That's, that should just right there should actually cause us to wonder. Wow. He is in all creation. He's in everything that he has ever made. He is in it. Jeremiah in chapter 23 says, am I only a God nearby and not a God of far away? Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them? Do I, do not I fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? He fills heaven and earth. Now just think about the universes, the stars, all that there is out there, and he's in it. He fills them all. That should just cause us to fall on our face and in absolute be awestruck. Um, 
He fills the heavens and the earth. He occupies every space. He occupies all of time. That's why he's called the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. He's in it all. Isaiah in chapter 46 says, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. He's in all things. He is all things. And he said, what is still to come? Um, so his omnipre omnipresence is about his being, being in all time and all of space. And he can, without that, he's the one that the Bible says he holds everything together. If he wasn't in it all, we would, sp all it takes is one millimeter of a second if he withdrew holding things together the nations the world the universes everything would fall apart i mean just just dwell on that for a while and think you are you are by a thread hanging i am by a thread hanging to this uncreated god that holds it all in the palm of his hands and what is going to happen that that is just absolutely incredible um so we're talking about his omnipresence being one aspect of the presence of god and we want to go through three in, tonight and the second aspect or dimension is that of what we may call the indwelling spirit and we today need a tremendous revelation of the indwelling spirit that dwells within every believer so his his omnipresence sustains all things and then he gives us the indwelling spirit that dwells within us and um is is there for those that believe in Christ. <clears throat> That's where it's actually in, in, uh, imparted by the Spirit of God when He comes to take up residency inside of us. So, this uncreated God, the God that in all things, He's even so note such as He would come dwell with inside a man. Bible says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. And then Jesus says, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and, and we will come to them and make our home in them. Again, that just the simplicity of salvation, and that he would take up residency in each one of us should be mind-boggling. But it's so easy to make it this trivial, I'm saved, I'm born again, I'm going to heaven, and that's the end of my, rather than seeing the reality the uncreated God that fills all space and time gives me the indwelling spirit to actually have a relationship with that God that he created as far. He chooses by his sovereign act to come dwell within you and I to make his home in us. He didn't have to choose any of us to come dwell within, to take up residency. But in his kindness, in his goodness, he chose each one of us. And by the Holy Spirit, he comes and releases the indwelling spirit that would dwell within us and makes his home within us. And the awesome thing about the indwelling spirit, it's not only that he comes personal, he comes corporate. It's both and if you look at the the letters in the to the churches and all you'll see it there but it's again it's it's a for an individual the individual person 
he comes to give the indwelling spirit to dwell with inside. But with the corporate body, he gives the indwelling spirit to come amongst. He comes and dwells with us amongst when we're together as a body on this Zoom call. He's saying, my presence is there with you. Take it seriously. I'm there in your midst right now. I've given you the indwelling spirit for this meeting tonight. You have nothing to say apart from my indwelling spirit that's in you. Let it come out. That's just absolutely amazing. So <clears throat> it's always been his desire that he would bring us and uh, into his plans that he has for us from the beginning of time. And he's always dreamed that he would dwell with us once again. We are the redeemed. Um, let me see here. I'm going to skip a little of this tonight. Um, so just to remember, he, he, his spirit comes to us to dwell within us and amongst us corporately. And it's, in, it's, it's him that brings unity in the body. Or if I'm not um, operating in the spirit, we can bring division. But there's a third dimension that's really important that you, you, you hear us mention quite often. And it's one of my absolute passions and dreams is to see the manifest presence of God on the earth. And we've all seen it to some degree. But there's, there is a dimension that goes beyond the dwelling place, and that's called the Shekinah glory. Or you can refer to it as the manifest presence of God. <clears throat> Shekinah mean, and, uh, is used in the verb form, shaken. It means to reside or permanently stay, to abide, to dwell, to continue, to, to inhabit, to remain. So it's about a long duration of his presence with us. And the manifest presence of, the God, of God is also called the glory of the Lord. And the word glory in the English Bible is translated from the Hebrew word that we've all heard of, kebab, which means heaviness or weightiness. The Shekinah glory is, is the weightiness of God. And his glory, it, it's about he comes and he shines, his glory shines forth his character and his nature, the personality of who he is. So it's not just showing himself in some glorious work. What he's actually trying to show us is, this is how good I am. We get caught up in the awesome thing he's doing, but it actually is about who I am in my nature and character. That's how much he's even concerned about our inner man. Because he's about what's inside, who the person is. So the glory of the Lord is, is, again, heavy, it's weighty, and his glory, again, is about shining forth. The glory comes, and it shines forth the character of who he is, revealing to us his manifestation through his, the manifestation of his presence. Um, let's see here. His... his Omnipotence, again, is, is throughout all creation. Really important, just we're going to differentiate these three. His omnipresence is simply about him being in all creation. His indwelling presence resides in every born-again believer as a response to our step of faith in him. But the manifest 
presence or the manifest Shekinah presence is about a sovereign move of God. It only comes by the sovereign move of God. He chooses when he's going to do that. He chooses the time, the place. Everything about his Shekinah glory depends upon him. However, it is in response to one thing. The Shekinah glory comes in response to our hunger for his glory. He holds back the Shekinah glory until his people get hungry enough to cry out over and over and over, it's your Shekinah glory I want. I love the indwelling presence. I love your that, that positionally that your presence is all around me. But to desire his Shekinah glory, we can only respond to bring that forth. <clears throat> and it can increase or decrease by our pursuit or by our, our intensity in our pursuit. And it's about the seeking of his face, walking in consecration, prayer and fasting, uh, walking in holiness. It's about one of the greatest things about it is learning how to host his presence. Most people don't know how to host other people. Now imagine hosting his presence. But to think of the privilege to, for him to say, I choose you to host my presence on earth. That's just absolutely mind-boggling, but it, re it requires. Everybody can't host his presence. There's requirements there pertaining to the seeking and the searching heart, walking in consecration, living in prayer, fasting, seeking him and such. Um, his, his omnipresence, again, permeates all places. His indwelling presence resides in us, but the Shekinah, Shekinah glory or the Shekinah presence comes to rest on us. So he's all around us. He gives us the indwelling spirit inside of us. And then he's offered the presence of God, the Shekinah presence, to come and rest upon us. Which is what we desire or should desire. And it's, it's called the manifest presence because it's accomplished um, by manifestation of his power. And it's about what we like to talk about at Mosaic, it's about his goodness. What he's actually doing with the Shekinah glory is, yes, it's a time of power, but it's also about, I want to show you my goodness, how good I am. When Moses prayed, now, Lord, show me your glory, the Lord responds saying, I will cause what? My goodness to pass in front of you. When we're asking him to show us the Shekinah glory, we're actually saying, show me your goodness. How many of us need to see his goodness? It's available to all of us. And the manifest, uh, presence was manifested to him. Um, so it's about, again, his goodness. It's about his power. Um, and when it rests upon man or mankind, it also releases during that time through his power, extraordinary gifts of the spirit. And they become evident in increased ways, in increased measure. As his power is released to you and I, they are good gifts of manifestation. They're gifts of his goodness. He's releasing in us again. I'm going to show you how good I am by releasing to you unprecedented power to release my goodness and my works through my power to, to those around you. But again, it's really important to remember that the manifest presence is a sovereign move or a sovereign act that only he can bring. 
through the Holy Spirit. And there are conditions that we can, leading up to that, that we can welcome the Spirit and also host him. I want to read quickly here from uh, the Azusa Street Revival that, that goes with this. And it says, the services ran almost continually. Seeking souls could not be found under the power, um, or could be found under the pow power almost any hour, night and day. The place was never closed nor empty. The people came to meet God. He was always there, hence the continuous meeting. The meeting did not depend upon a human leader. God's presence became more and more wonderful, and his presence was the leader. In the old building with its low rafters and bare floors, God took strong men and women to pieces and put them back together again for his glory. It was tremendous overhauling process. Pride and self-assertion, self-importance, self-esteem could not survive in his presence. The religious ego preached to its own funeral very quickly. We saw some wonderful things in those days. Even very good men came to abhor themselves in the clearer light of God. The preachers died the hardest. They had so much to die in, too. So much reputation and good works. But when God got through with them, they gladly turned a new page and chapter. That was one reason they fought so hard. Death is not at all a pleasant experience. And strong men die very hard. The meetings started themselves. Spontaneously, in testimony, praise, and worship. There was no prearranged program to be jammed through our time. Our time was the Lord's. We had genuine testimonies from fresh heart experiences. Otherwise, the shorter the testimonies, the better. A dozen might be on their feet at once, trembling under the power of God. We did not have to get it from our leaders. We didn't have to get a cue from the leaders. We were there. We were free from lawlessness. We were shut up to God in prayer in the meetings, our minds on him. So you see here that, that people responded to his presence and it overtook routine religion. It overtook, was overtaken by power and glory and the goodness of the Lord. So um, we again, have the opportunity to prepare for his presence, to, to um, welcome his goodness. And in the midst of it, we should understand and stand before him at all. His majesty and his glory, that should actually cause us to actually burst forth in worship, in genuine worship, where we don't care about time, we don't care about anything but the presence of the Lord. It's not about three songs, six songs, standing up, shouting, whatever it is. It's about the heart connecting with, from the internal dwelling spot with the glory of the Lord. And he wants us, again, to all learn to host his presence. And when we learn to host his presence is the time that he begins to... Um, Come and stay with us. So just quickly here, we're talking about his, his presence, his passion, and his priority. And um, in saying that, that the, the Lord does not want to just visit us. He truly, truly wants to come stay with us in order that we not only have a touch, but we're overwhelmed by his presence. And he wants to be his glory to reside in us permanently. He's not looking for a dwelling place just to come for part time. He, he really does want to inhabit all of us in every way, shape, or form. In Psalm 132, it talks about, we all know this scripture, but it speaks expressing the passion of David's heart. And it expresses the passion of David's heart because he knew about the presence. 
This is what he lived in. Surely I will not enter my house nor lie in my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty God of Jacob. That's what he's called us as believers to prepare the way for him coming. That should not be just a nice little quote or scripture to use in the prayer movement. It, it, it truly is, shows the absolute passion of his heart that God, I have got to have you. I desire you. I want you. And I want, this is my words to you. I'm not doing this, this, or this until. I see you come. He was about the glory of the Lord, finding a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. So we've got presence, we've got passion, and we've got priority. And priority is about, we want to know of his presence and understand his presence. We've got to have the passion to pursue his presence. <clears throat> And we have to learn how to establish him as number one, as the very priority of our lives over all things. It's a pro there's only one thing a priority. Can't we have 10 priorities? There's one thing that is the priority in all of our lives. And it's a tough question, but it's a question that has to be asked. Um, in our day, because of there's so much in the world, there's so much busyness, everything we need in America, it's offered to us. And that's a blessing. However, the problem with it is, is that it's called us to truly lack passion for God. And the Lord, he offers us a future. He offers us hope. He op offers us life. So he gives us this, 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 this um, promise that I'll give you this. But it's based on passion for his presence. We don't like to hear that, but, but if I'm not passionate about him, my hope will always, what's the word I'm looking for? Wane. That's how we drift. Passion holds us anchored in him. That it's you I've got to have. It's you I've got to have. When you're not, when your passion's about something, it will always become the natural priority. It's not to, to, for any of us, it's not to bring condemnation. It's to take the heart check. Where are my priorities? Is it really for the Lord in his presence? Or am I attaching it? We speak of the religious spirit. If I'm not passionate about him and he's number one, I'm actually walking in religion. Because I'm making other things the priority rather than the priority of him which causes my pursuit and it really has nothing to do with our schedules our busy life and i'm speaking from experience here i know we all think in in our culture that i don't have time for this or for that but the reality is it's really not based on that you see a passionate person can have an hour a day and can, can get just as much in as a person with 23 hours a day. It's learning how to prioritize what he's, what he's given you, in other words. And that's really important to understand. Otherwise, we beat ourselves up and bring condemnation on. Um, but it really doesn't have anything to do with that. Again, when you're thirsty, you're going to go get a drink. That simple. When you're hungry, I'm going to go get something to eat. And the presence of God is the same way. And that's what creates the passion. That when I want him, are we going to go get him? Are we going to live with that kind of a heart that 
It's the seeking heart. It's the searching heart. Oh, God, you are the one I long for. You are the one my heart is burning for. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to act upon it. Because those that have him as the priority will always choose the important thing. It's not in perfection, but it's going to provoke us to truly choose him and the time we have over the world's ways. Um, and at the end of this, the greatest motivation for me and for you is a word we all use a lot and that is called wisdom and revelation it takes revelation upon revelation upon revelation to bring motivation that says i can't live without this only revelation will bring motivation you can try to make yourself do something i can try to make myself do something but I have to have revelation, you know, that this food isn't good for me, whatever it may be. In all the areas of life, it applies. That revelation is always the best motivation because it's the light bulb going off. Aha, uh -huh, I got it. Now I'm going to have to live this. But it provokes us to live it, not to want, not just the make it a religious rule so i challenge us all that uh, to to check our priorities and let the presence of god be the motivation behind our lives and why we're living so just um you know the the presence of god we there's so many different aspects but and what we do especially, and it's, it's actually for everybody, the presence of God is what provokes us to worship. Because when we begin to understand the presence of God, it's not just something we want. It's we begin to know of the nature and the character of the one who's provoking us. We begin to see that as I behold him dimly in a mirror, he is changing me from what? Glory to glory to glory. He's changing me by his presence internally from glory to glory to glory. And um, so I guess my challenge tonight would just be to, to spend some time thinking about, Lord, where, where does your presence really set in my heart where does your present line up in my life and what is it that i want to pursue after because that's what he's trying to do is bring us all back to actually living in the manifestation of his presence that never ends that never stops that's going to happen in heaven but what do we talk about is on earth as it is in heaven he wants to manifest all that is in heaven on earth the problem is not him the problem is us lining our hearts with him his ways his plans his purposes coming into alignment of how to shed the sin and the complacency and the stuff that keeps us from his presence and then begin to search and seek after him with all our hearts. And then it boils down simply to, to get there is to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then it provokes us by his presence to love others as we love our, ourselves. So keep the journey up. And I would challenge you if you've never read, I'm not a big person of theological books personally i get bogged down in them but if you've never pulled out theological books and looked at studies on his presence do it because the language that was used in so many of these guys describing again the presence and what what it is uh 
can can uh, involve it with that, it really does cause you to go to a place of wow, to be awestruck and, and just absolutely overcome and overwhelmed. That he's be. How do you describe the presence of God? It's not something that was ever intended to be described. It was intended to experience. And guess what? He's so kind. He does this differently with each one of us. And no one's more important than the other. Cassie may see millions of people healed. Jennifer may see millions of people come to Christ. You know, Julie may raise many, many people from the dead. And on and on and on. He manifests himself differently to each one of us. Sometimes it's a voice. Sometimes it's an internal feeling. It's not one gets the best activity, you know, the best way. That's who he is. He's, he, he's no respecter of person. So don't get jealous for another person's way that he speaks and moves upon them. Enjoy the way God speaks and moves in and through you. Because it's going to come when you, when you actually embrace that you're going to realize it can flow through you a lot easier. That's right. Because you begin to understand, well, this is the way he chose to write my story and how I experienced the presence of God. So love you guys. And just, uh, again, I, I'm so grateful that we have the opportunity to talk about this and, and have over the years. And, you know, I do. I long to see... I mean, my dream on earth before I die is to see the tangible evidence of his presence on the earth. And the manifestation of his presence is actually the cloud. It's the rain. It's the glory. Every now and then I go back to Bethel. There's a video on YouTube. When rain began happening in, at Bethel inside the building, it's like the dust is just falling and you see it and I'm like, well, that's the manifestation of his presence. No man can work that up. No man can fake it. It was just as genuine as we're sitting here tonight. But that's who he is. And he is trying to bring us back into that reality, just like in the Garden of Eden, that we experience him in that way, inside out, day and night. So let this tonight, as you spend some time, let it provoke all of us. I'm asking him just let this, what I've been studying again, provoke me into a new place of, of worship. You know, and just, it, 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 how can it help it to understand his nature and character, his personality, and then his goodness that he would let it pass by us. And how many times a day has he really let his goodness pass by us? And I can miss it all together at times. When you look back, you're like, that was you, God. You, 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 just, you just walked past me. I want to recognize it each and every time because it'll provoke to watch out for it more and more and, and allow us to be overwhelmed. Man, so much rich stuff tonight. I mean, rich, rich stuff. Um, you know, Stacy was talking about uh, the garden and the presence and dad, the omnipresence and the manifest presence and his indwelling presence. And one of the things that dad, you said that isn't it amazing. You said a couple of times that he chose us to host his presence, right? That he chose to live inside of us and dwell his presence inside of us. I mean, literally Jesus said, I have to go so that you can have the Holy Spirit, Right. So Jesus knew what this would mean for our history in God and for humanity of experiencing oneness with the Trinity, right? And as you said that, it just, it hit me, you know, um, you are the garden. I am the garden. Amen. We are the temple. We, we, we see this biblically, but not just information, I'm the garden, I am the garden. So what's the garden? The garden is the pleasure place of God, right? And why was the garden the pleasure place of God? It wasn't because of the structures or the trees or the birds. It was because Adam and Eve were there 
I was one with him. He wants oneness with yeah. his creation, his sons and daughters. And so as you were saying that, you know, it's like, I am the garden, you are the garden and his presence is the river and it's flowing to you and through you. Through you. And if we read through the, what happened, the, the, the river didn't stop at the garden, right? It went through the garden. It didn't stop at the garden. It wasn't just for the garden. The river went from the throne of God through the garden and it brought jewels and nurtured the lands outside of the garden, right? And it's, it's the, the evidence that as the presence of God is dwelling in us, that he wants to expand that presence all throughout the world. That Vicky, I want you to share a little bit tonight. Um, you have been, you know, for me, I've watched you and Mark, and I've I've watched your life and your time at the mo- in the morning and your time with God. And I'm sure there was a moment where you probably it went from uh, prioritizing time to actually longing for that presence when did you start (laughs) your journey of experiencing i want more of his presence and what did that look like like what made you start doing that yeah no that's good um actually i was looking kind of back today uh i don't even know what year but i know that it had a lot to do with the um are they called internship? Uh, the in- uh, what did we do? Intensives. Um, yeah, I don't know what year we did the first one of those or whatever, but long time ago. Um, I think that's when I really uh, started because you know we talked a lot in there. Y'all taught a lot about how um, you know to 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 put your spending time with God in your calendar. Put prioritize and, 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 um, you know, make a place if you will, and, and really look at your days and where you're spending your time and how you're spending your time and everything. And I think it was, you know, kind of back then, whenever I really got more focused, I guess, on that. And I began to really, uh, decide, you know, just felt like getting up early in the morning was the best, you know, for me, uh, way before, you know, everything started, because there was no interruptions, no, uh, you know, just not, there was nothing that could take away my time, away from my time, you know, and, um, and at first, it was a discipline, you know, you know, to get up early like that, and, um, but then it was just so sweet, because I would just get up, and, and it was like God was showing me, I, this really not a time that I study the Bible. I don't even, sometimes don't even read the Bible. It's just, I've got worship music on. It's just, it was just, God started me on the journey of just that his presence, you know, just going after his presence, just being with him. How much, um, you know, he loved being with me. And then out of that, you know, I, I, I read this scripture today. It just kind of popped up in one of my things in Psalm 37, 4, which we all know. But it says, you know, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And it's kind of, that kind of summed up, I was thinking of, you know, it's like, you know, I began to delight myself in the Lord. And I believe when he's saying he's going to give you the desires of your heart, it's not, you know, houses and cars and, you know, all those things you think when you're first, you know, or healing or, you know, whatever, uh, whatever those things are, which are from the Lord and for us, you know, gifts, but he's given us the desire of our hearts, which he created us, right? And our desire is to have his presence, you know, right? And so when we delight ourselves, and so I began just to spend that time in the mornings, um, it began to be a delight, you know, I could delight myself in the Lord because he would manifest his presence at different times. And, but then there also were many times that nothing happened, you know, I mean, I would leave, you know, I'd be in the hour or two hours in and, and nothing. I didn't feel anything. I didn't know anything happened. And, you know, I think we started teaching the kids way back when that, you know, when you spend time with the Lord, know something happened in your heart, even if you don't feel him, because that's who he is. I mean, that's, 
you know, that's God is when you spend time with him, he does something inside of you that in your humanity, you might not know what it is that he did, but it always did. So there's many times I just walk away and go, okay, Lord, I, I know you did something. I have no idea what it was, but I'm just trusting you. There were many times I fall asleep you know? And at first it was like, oh my gosh, you know, Vicki, stay awake. What's going on, you know, and stuff. And then it'd be like, it would be so sweet. And the Lord would just be like, it's okay to just rest in me, even if that means falling asleep, you know, and stuff. And so anyway, it just, it just went from, I guess back then, just, I, I put, the, put it in my, my uh, calendar, you know, I, I did it, you know, uh, as faithful as, as, as his grace, you know, allowed me to. And, um, and it's just been a sweet, sweet uh time i guess just yeah so vicky let me ask you this uh, i know you know from experience all of us on this call but just when did you see it begin and maybe explain you know what this felt like in the transition when i'm sure there came a time where it be, no longer became about the time in your calendar that you intentionally right. encountered him but it began to carry over through many times in your day that <laughs> Maybe we're unexpected. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's good, Casty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when I, yeah, I think that's what it, once, once I began the discipline and then, you know, then I would, and I may go, you know, like I said, I might go all that morning and not even know anything or feel anything or anything, but then it would be later in the day, you know, that something would happen and I would just, I would just sense God's presence or I would see, you know, his provision or his protection and he would reveal himself to me and, and I would begin to, you know, connect the dots, you know, okay, I spent, I spent that time and even though I didn't know what happened then, all of a sudden here, or when I went to get into the word, I would have this revelation, you know, in the word and, and I just, yeah, just, yeah, it just makes me weak to even think he's just so good that it just began to turn into, you know, a love affair and not a, uh, like you were talking about the rules. And it's interesting, you know, because um, the discipline does seem like a rule sometimes, you know, when you start, the discipline feels like, oh my gosh, I'm going to get up, you know, and it was faithful because I never set an alarm or anything. God was faithful when I asked him, you know, that's my journey is I asked him that I wanted to get up early. Boy, he would, he jumps at the, at the opportunity to wake you up that's for sure you know and stuff and so um i've never had to set an alarm or anything like that and he'd just wake you up early and and then, you know then all of a sudden when he wakes you up it would be this like what do you have for me today you know it, it would just be this excitement and 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 stuff so yeah i don't know exactly when that happened it's been so many years now it seems like but um when you're it just those things started happening you know, for me, and I started experiencing him through my day and in things. And that's what, you know, propelled me into, you know, wanting to be in that time with him. Um, yeah. yeah. So, Vicki, let me ask you one question. Okay. And, uh, you know, we are recording this. Okay. <laughs> so what would you say to someone that, man, they're getting up and they're, they're reading their Bible plan? They're, you know, doing all the dotted things that uh, you should do to read and study. And, and they're like, I know there's more than this. Mm -hmm. What would you say to that person to mm -hmm. speak into their heart, into this journey? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, um, this doesn't negate any of this stuff, but he's not a Bible plan. Um, he is a real person and Bible plans are great. And that's a great way to read your Bible. But, um, you know, like I said, there, most mornings in my early mornings, I'm not reading my Bible, you know, um, I've been, God's been so gracious. I have a lot of, uh, scripture, you know, that comes to my mind and those kind of things and stuff. But, um, I would just encourage people, first of all, make it a discipline, ask the Lord to wake you up, you know, when he wants to speak to you. And when he, when, you know, when you get woke up, you know, get up, you know, and it, it's hard sometimes, you know, and it's, sometimes it's not even, you know, now you understand, we all understand that intercessors, it could be in the middle of the night and sometimes I'm up, you know, till one or two. And so I sleep in in the morning. So it just kind of 
you know, goes to that. But anyway, get back to the question is, I think I would just, you know, know that, that he does desire to, to be with you and not condemn yourself, you know, and, and if he calls you and you don't go, like, it's okay, you know, there's the next time, there's a lot of grace uh, for it, you know, uh, just to, yeah, be encouraged that, um, you know, he's wait, I guess just, I feel, like, you know, he's waiting to be there to spend time with you and look at it as, um, you know, a relationship and not a, um, you know, not a plan, not a, uh, you know, I got 15 minutes and then I got to go thing. It's like, just let yourself uh, be wooed. Cause like somebody said on this call already, he is always wooing us. He's always pursuing us. And just to give into that and ask God for the grace, you know, it's only, we can't do any of this apart from his grace, but just to press into his grace and allow, um, you know, uh, his grace to enable you to go into that place that he has for you. So a few um, aspects of one, you know, kind of the, the way that the Lord's made me, kind of my DNA is a continuous, right, improvement. So I'm the type that if I fail, then I'm going to sign up back for it tomorrow. And I'm going to strive for it. If I don't hit it, I'll sign back up tomorrow. So one of the things that I've been wanting to do <clears throat> is wake up earlier. And I've just really hadn't been, I'm the, I'm the type where if I know that I have to get up, then I can get up. Not a problem, even if it's three hours. If I know that I have to get up, then I can get up. But it's the imaginary timeline where to go up until I have to get up. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to wake up early. But that wouldn't really work. And so I was mentioning on one of the other calls that uh, I've been blessed because during this quarantine time, right before um, – everything went haywire, my mom was helping me move. And so she's been stuck in this quarantine with me for the last two and a half, three months. Has it been two and a half, yeah, um, months. And so I really have been feeling like the Lord's been saying, hey, this is a time where we can create habits that, um, that are unique to this season because of everything that's going on. And so being able to have the blessing of having my mother here, um, I said, now's the time to begin the habit. And so I asked her, I said, hey, I've been trying to do this for a while now. Can you wake me up at five o'clock? Um, and so over the last probably three weeks now, she'll come and she'll knock on the door. She'll open up the door. She'll click on the lights. And uh, what I found is, is that my routine is that I'll open up the water and I'll drink um, a uh, drink a little bottle of water and that gets me up. And so um, I say all that to say it's been amazing because I knew that I couldn't do it on my own strength. And, and it's you know, not out of religious duty or anything like that. I just really felt like it was a time where I just wanted to meet with God. And I knew that that was a uh, good you know, time for me to do that. Um, and so it's just been amazing because I'm seeing what was negotiable move into a non-negotiable. And in those moments, it's just been the sweet presence, right, of God. And sometimes I'll just spend it reading, or sometimes he'll just control that, um, control that time. But it really took creating accountability around a desire that I wanted, and that I also knew that God desired as well. And so um, that has been extremely critical for me in that discipline of uh, wanting to wake up early.